topic of shame is so interesting because I think we can relate to all these feelings, right? Like we've experienced anger, we've experienced hurt, but shame is one that, wow, it hits hard and it hits deep. And my question in starting this whole process was, how can shame be a gift, right? If you've been coming week after week, you've heard Josh talk about the gift of anger and the gift of hurt. And I'm like, I don't get how shame is a gift. But before we get to how it's a gift, I want to start with the origin of shame. Now, I uh, am a nerd, and I love watching TED Talks. They're like one of my favorite things to do, so much so that um, Ethan, my husband, used to tell me, like, when you prep a sermon, prep a sermon, not a TED Talk, because it's like my goal to be in TED. Anyways, if you don't know what that is, it's just, it's really nerdy. So anyways, Brene Brown is someone who has made a living off of talking about shame and vulnerability, and I have 30 minutes. So I'm not going to cover every piece of it, but I encourage you that if this is a topic that really hits home, to do some more research on it. But I was texting my friend Josh this morning, he's a youth pastor in Massachusetts, and he was like, hey, praying for you this morning, and how he says it is, yo, girl, praying for you, um, because he's a youth pastor and that's how they talk, but <laughs> I was like, you know, I, he asked me if I had heard of Brene Brown, and I said, do you know me? I said, but what's interesting is I have heard every single talk that Brene Brown has given on shame. I own every single book that Brene Brown has written, and I've actually read most of them. But this book gave me a more clear understanding on shame than I have learned in the past seven, eight years of following Brene Brown. And so she is a phenomenal resource, but I want to look at the origin of shame from scripture because, wow, it is eye-opening. And so we're going to start in Genesis. And the first part of this, we're going to kind of jump through some, some passages. So um, I'm just going to read them from the screen. Once we get into our kind of anchor text, we'll, uh, we'll sit there for a little bit. But Genesis, if you're new to Bible study, it's the first book of the Bible. Chapter 3. We got three chapters into the Bible before we deal with shame. And this is the story and how it goes. The serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals the Lord God had made. And so, just real, real briefly, if you are not familiar with this passage, um, the serpent is actually Satan. And what a way to start a Sunday morning with talking about Satan. But um, we have an enemy. It is real. We have somebody who is fighting for our soul just as much as God is. And so it's important to acknowledge that, that Satan is real. And so the serpent is Satan in the form of a snake, which is why I hate snakes. I'm just saying. Sorry if you love them. One day he asked the woman, did God really say to you, um, did God really say you must not eat of the fruit from any of the trees in the garden? And of course not. We may eat from the fruit of the trees of the garden, the woman replied. It's only the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that we are not allowed to eat. God said you must not eat it or even touch it. If you do, you will die. You won't die, the serpent replied to the woman. God knows that your eyes will be opened as soon as you eat it, and you will be like God, knowing both good and evil. So this is the very first temptation of mankind. Right now, existing on the earth is Adam and Eve and a bunch of animals, including the serpent, who has already begun to twist God's words. So this is just side note. God said you must not eat it, but then... The words got twisted to you shouldn't even touch it. I just think that's interesting how so quickly we can twist what God has said. We can read it through the lens of our eyes or hear it through maybe somebody who's not guiding us according to scripture and it's, it's off. But the woman was convinced. She saw that the tree was beautiful and its fruit looked delicious and she wanted the wisdom it would give her. So she took some of the fruit and ate it, and then she gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it too. Now this is, this is the point. This is where it starts, right? At that moment, their eyes were opened, and they suddenly felt shame at their nakedness. So they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. Shame was the first repercussion of sin. When Adam and Eve's eyes were open, they saw their limitedness and it manifested as shame. 
brokenness leads to shame because it forces us to focus on what we can't do, what we didn't do, what we didn't accomplish, that we didn't measure up. And as we see in these verses, shame has the ability to create fear and loneliness, two of the feelings that we've already talked through in this series. But there's hope, right? So what's interesting is a lot of people have been studying this concept of shame, and I came across this um, PhD, and uh, it was in Glamour magazine, so take it with a grain of salt. But I thought it was interesting (laughs) because... (laughs) Google is really helpful for sermon prepping. Trust me, I consulted biblical commentaries as well. But what I thought was interesting is shame has, if somebody says, I feel shame, no one immediately goes to, good for you. Right, like that's just dumb. Like you're not gonna say, oh, I'm so happy I'm feeling shame right now. Like it's largely and has been historically, even through scripture, a negative reality. Right, and so this guy says, whenever something is painful, we try to ward it off and fend against it. And sometimes that is okay, but sometimes defending against shame stops us from learning something. This article was published in 2022. (laughs) People are just getting around to the fact that maybe shame isn't all negative. But it remains solely negative if we do not learn how to grow from its existence in our lives. And so I want to look at just briefly four types of shame, and then we're going to get to our our anchor passage. But I think it's important to kind of introduce and create um, a picture for what shame looks like. And I was prepping this, and I was thinking, oh, I should explain all of these. And then I was like, no, I don't think these need any explanation. Like, genuinely, I think that as soon as you see these words on the screen, you'll be like, oh, right. Yeah, okay. I feel that. The first one, unrequited love. Any questions? (laughs) If you want to search scripture for a story about unrequited love, let me point you to the story of Hosea. The second one, exclusion. Of course, no one's felt that before. You want more information on that? Check out the story of Joseph in Genesis. He gets it. The third one, unwanted exposure. And I think that's typically what we go to when we think of shame. Is this just like embarrassment, humiliation moment that traps us? And if you want someone who can relate to that, check out the first few verses of John 8, where the woman was literally ripped out of bed, caught in the act of adultery, and thrown in front of a crowd of men. Talk about unwanted exposure. And the fourth one, disappointed expectation, which none of us has ever experienced in the last 10 seconds, maybe. (laughs) There's a story of a lame man sitting by a pool in John 5. Boy, there are a lot of unmet expectations there. But here's the truth, is that in Hebrews, we learn that while we all are susceptible to this feeling of shame, good, bad, or indifferent, we're not alone in it. And if you were here a few weeks ago, I actually preached on loneliness, and it's just incredible how well these two topics go hand in hand. And so Hebrews chapter 12 starts like this. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. And let us run with endurance the race that God has set before us. And I just want to ask you this morning to be really honest with yourself. This isn't a raise your hand thing. I'm not going to ask you to write on your communication card the answer to this question. But I want to challenge you to truly reflect on this question. In what areas of your life has shame tripped you up? Brene Brown says that there are 12 categories of shame, money and work, family, parenting, motherhood, fatherhood, which I think is 
parenting, but that's okay. Appearance and body image, mental and physical health, addiction, sex, surviving trauma, being stereotyped or labeled, aging, religion. We've all experienced at least one, if not multiple of these today. And the question is, how do you respond when that happens? How do we strip off everything that holds us back? And how do we stop sin from tripping us up? Verse 2. I love when, like, the Bible just gives us the answer. Right there. Like, sometimes there are verses in the Bible where you're like, what does that mean? And this one's like, let me tell you. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and now he is seated at the place of honor beside God's throne. This is what I love about this verse, right? Jesus felt shame. I dare say he felt all four of the types of shame on the cross simultaneously. But he disregarded it. Some versions say he set it aside. He ignored it. He did nothing. He didn't pay any attention to it. Why? How? What does that even look like? He knew his call, and he knew God. His eyes were set on the future and not on the present. Jesus did not allow shame to stop him from fulfilling his calling. And my prayer is that none of us would allow shame to trip us up and stop us. We should not allow shame to stop us from living out our God-given giftedness and calling. See, shame exposes our limitedness. We've, we've acknowledged that. We agree on that. But if we allow it to, it also exposes our giftedness and our calling. Have you ever thought of it that way? I didn't. I had no, I read this and I was like reading through different, like I said, different commentaries, not just articles online. I was reading scripture and I was like, oh my goodness. Shame exposes my weakness, but it also exposes my strength. And so some of you might be like, whoa, open it up to my, my God-given giftedness and calling. Like, who's calling? I'm, what? I don't have a calling. I don't know. I'm not, you are not going to get me up on that stage to preach a sermon. Like, absolutely not, right? Because that's what we so often think in church world is a God's calling on your life is you have to be the pastor. You have to be the speaker. You have to be the, the New York Times bestselling author. Like, those are people who have callings on their lives. But I'm going to challenge you on that one today. Because 1 Corinthians, and this is where we're going to, really anchor today. So if you have your Bibles and want to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7, like, just straight up, a spiritual gift is given to each of us so we can help each other. So if you're like, I don't have a gift in this, I don't have a calling, yes, you do. We just have to figure out what it is. And this is what I love, is everyone is given a different one. No one has spiritual monopoly. Like, think about your workplace. Think about your family, right? It's so easy for us to be like, oh yeah, there are roles here. Like, we have the manager, we have the supervisor, we have the employee, we have the cashier, we have the person who does the tech, the IT, we have the teachers, the principal, the plumbers, the electricians. That all makes sense in our mind. But when it comes to church, for some reason, we've created this concept in our brains that the only people with purpose or calling or giftedness are the ones that you see on the stage with a microphone. And that's so far from the truth because here's the reality. You do not want me hanging out with your elementary age children. <laughs> My patience is like zero. I don't know how Sydney is so phenomenal with that age group. Like, it just exudes out of her. She can't help but be incredible with our elementary kids. And I'm just like, they didn't stop complaining the whole time. 
They just wanted snacks. I don't even know what this game that they want to play. Like, oh, they smell bad. Like, I am so not that person. So <laughs> I have to meet with an electrician this week. I think that's hilarious. I know nothing. I can turn on a light switch. So I'm like, Mark, our tech director, I'm like, please be available for this meeting because I literally have no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> but he does. None of us has monopoly on all of the giftedness, yet for some reason we allow our limitations to hold us back. Have you ever thought of it that way? We get upset when we can't do it all. Guess what? No one can do it all. So why do we hide from our limitations? We continue on reading these verses, and there is a lot to this chapter, and I am not going to read it all and get into it all, because I want you to be able to have a Sunday with your family. But please go back and read through these verses. They are incredible. To one person, the Spirit gives the ability to give wise advice. To another, the same Spirit gives a message of special knowledge. The same Spirit gives great faith to another, and to someone else, the Spirit gives the gift of healing. Right? These are just a few of these spiritual gifts. And you might be reading that and be like, I haven't healed anyone. <laughs> uh, I, don't, I don't identify with any of those gifts. There's more in there. <laughs> but shame forces us to focus on our limitedness instead of our giftedness. And I want to warn you to avoid the comparison trap. Somebody once said at some point, comparison is the thief of joy. And I think comparison is also the thief of us stepping into what God has gifted us and called us to do for the advancement of the gospel, for his glory, not for our own. When we don't deal with our shame properly, it becomes toxic. And so Paul continues in his letter to the Corinthians, the human body, we're in verse, whew, pregnancy brain, verse 12, the human body has many parts, but the many parts make up one body, so it is with the body of Christ. We're going to skip down to verse 14. Yes, the body has different parts, not just one part. If the foot says, I'm not a part of the body because I'm not a hand, that does not make it any less part of the body. And if an ear says, I'm not part of the body because I am not an eye, would it make it any less a part of the body? This is what we get caught up in. Well, I'm not an eye. Well, I'm not a, I'm not a good speaker. Like we saw that from the, be like, Old Testament, Moses, being, God gives him this calling to go and talk to Pharaoh, and he's like, I'm not good at, um, words are hard. <laughs> like, God is giving you this calling. Honestly, I think I've shared this story before, but when I first started doing ministry full-time, it was the summer of 2013, and I was a communication major in college, which was great, because it was just, you talked a lot. And when I got into the real world of, like, actually living in this occupation of having to communicate with people, I sat down at a table across from this guy named Bob, who is a legend in youth ministry in New England, and he was like, I want you to give the club talk, that's what we called um, our youth gatherings when I worked for this organization called Young Life, which we support, and they rock. He said, I want you to give the club talk this week. And I was like, He's like, yeah, yeah, it's on the cross. And I was like, <laughs> no. And I sat there for 45 minutes crying in the Biddeford Panera because I was so terrified of getting up in front of 25 high school students to tell them that Jesus died for them on the cross so they could have eternal life. And Bob was like, what is wrong with you? And I was like, I don't want to mess it up. I don't think I'm good enough. And he looked at me and said, you're giving yourself way too much credit. But that's what we do. I don't have time. I don't have capacity. I don't have experience. I don't have qualifications. I'm not good enough. And God's like, hello. When are you going to stop leaving me out of the equation? I created the world. I created you. I'm calling you into this, and I am walking with you every step of the way. And like I said at the beginning, 
in my weakness, he is strong. And I can tell you this because a couple weeks ago, I preached at a girls' camp in a gymnasium where it was 95 degrees, and I didn't pass out. And the only way we got through that week is by Jesus' strength and some peppermint oil on the back of my neck to keep me from overheating. (laughs) But here's the thing. We can get caught in our fear and our anxiety and our limitedness and this toxic shame spiral begins and it just goes and goes and goes and it's like a whirlpool that you can't get out of and even if you try to start swimming the other direction it's so strong that you're just going to get pulled by the current because all we ever do is focus on what we can't do and what I can't do and what I haven't accomplished and what I haven't achieved and God's like stop saying I Start listening to what I say of you, who I say you are. Open your Bible and see that just because you're not an I doesn't mean you don't have value. You know what one of the most valuable body parts is? Your big toe. It carries 40% of your weight. You lose your big toe at work, just heads up, this is future reference for somebody, You can sue the company for $35,000. You lose, like, your fourth toe, you don't even bother. (laughs) There's a bone in in your neck, and I am so not medical, so if I am off on this, blame Google. But there's a bone in your neck that's not connected to any other part of your body that you probably have never thought of unless you're a speech therapist or maybe a chiropractor or you're in the medical field. It's not attached to any other bone in your body. Seems like it's a little irrelevant. Except it's, (laughs) Ethan was joking that I should get insurance on this bone because it allows you to speak. (laughs) It literally, your like vocal cords and your everything, because I'm not medical, is connected to this floating bone that you're like, I've never heard of that one. It must not matter. Well, it sure does matter for me. And I happen to think it matters for you, too. And I think your spouse would probably agree. Sometimes. (laughs) Maybe not others. But toxic shame in our lives, this spiral produces humiliation. I'm not good enough. I can't do it. But healthy shame, shame viewed through the lens of the gospel, produces humility. What a beautiful, beautiful picture that is. To say, you know what? I'm not a hand. I'm not an eye. But those two things are pretty important. And I know where I can find them. Because the reality is, this verse that talks about many parts, one body, that's us. Every single person in here has something to contribute to the community of faith. A God-given gift and calling and talent that when we allow shame to stop us from using it, the whole body suffers. Verse 17 says this, if the whole body were an eye, how would you hear? If your whole body were an ear, how would you smell anything? You matter in God's kingdom. For his glory, not your own. The loss of one body part, like I said, your big toe, it holds 40% of your weight and balance. I, and I'm like aware of it now that I'm pacing, and I'm like, oh, yeah, if I didn't have my big toe right now, that'd be awkward. The loss of any part affects the whole body. And the same is true with the body of Christ, the church. The loss of one member of that church affects the whole church. We've seen this. If you were around when Pastor Rick passed away, the loss of one life affected everyone. And my fear is that we hold people like Pastor Rick to such a high regard that we forget that just like God created Pastor Rick, he created you, and he created me. And sometimes we let our pride get in the way of being a part of the local expression of the church for one reason or another. 
and the whole body suffers. This chapter continues, but our bodies have many parts and God has put each one just where he wants it. How strange a body would be if it had just one part. God knows how he created you. He knows that my giftedness is not with elementary children. But he knows that if Sydney were up here preaching, it'd be a lot more entertaining. <laughs> I can tell you that much. You would laugh a lot more. But he's given us each giftings, callings, and abilities that, sure, Sydney could come up here and preach, and I could go into children's ministry and lead that, but y'all would suffer. The kids probably way more so. And sometimes when we, like, just hold on to what we want or what we think, like, for me to say, no, I'll drive kids to club, but I don't want to speak, that damages the whole body. Because God knows how he created us. He knows how we're designed. He knows our giftedness. Do you? There are many parts, but only one body. The eye can never say to the hand, I don't need you. The head can't say to the feet, I don't need you. Acknowledging our limitedness helps to fight against a prideful spirit. We need each other. And here's the part that gets me every time, especially since COVID. And if I offend you right now, I'm sorry, but the number of people who have said, and it's probably not you guys because you're in the room, sorry, online, but the number of people who have said, it is way more comfortable to watch church from my pajamas. It is just, like, gas is expensive. I'm just going to, I'm going to tune in online while I'm on the treadmill not paying attention at all. I'll watch it with my kids screaming in the background because honestly it's just easier than trying to wrangle them to get to bed or to get to church. <laughs> Wrangling to get to bed is also difficult. You're stopping somebody else from being able to experience the wholeness of the body. Sure, maybe you don't need to go to church to hear the sermon or to connect with the Lord, but the church needs you here. Josh and I had to preach to an empty room during COVID. That was real awkward. Not many people laugh at my jokes now. Even fewer laughed at them then. Like, I'm just saying, our body suffered during COVID because we couldn't gather. And are we going to allow inconvenience or preference or busy schedules on our part to cause harm to the rest of the body? I hope not. It's been so encouraging to see families returning because body parts are coming back. The creatives are coming back. The givers are coming back. It's helpful for me. The people who want to do global outreach, they're coming back. The people who have a passion for worship are coming back. The people who have children are coming back because our kids' ministry is real boring when there's one kid in it. The whole body suffers when we don't prioritize being a part of it. I'm going to skip like a bunch of slides right now, so if you can just read through the rest of this chapter, I promise it's real good. Can you, Al, can you just go to the end of this scripture? passage like all the way through there's a lot okay I feel like a broken record but that's because this message is very very complex and very very simple at the same time shame exists period how we handle it how we approach it how we view it the weight we allow it to have on our lives is the kicker. The loss of one member of the church affects the whole church, and we cannot allow shame to shut us down. We had to shut down physically because of a global pandemic. 
That was out of our control. This is not. This is very much in our ability to say, I'm not going to allow my insecurities, my inadequacies, the inconvenience of it all, my inexperience to stop me from participating in what God wants to do. Because believe it or not, our leadership team is not just pumped with having full seats on a Sunday morning. Our leadership team isn't just pumped when our budget can operate in whatever color it's supposed to operate. Black? Like I said, no monopoly on giftedness. <laughs> sure, our board wants for our kids' ministries to be crazy huge and for you know, our social media presence to be actually engaging, but what our leadership team wants, what the heartbeat of our entire pastoral team is, is for our community to know the love of Jesus. And I don't have access to where you have access. I don't have a voice where you can speak freely. I don't know your families. I can't speak the language of your career field. But you know who can? You. And so while, yes, you may be limited in some areas, you are gifted, and you are called, and you are equipped in others. So how do we work through this spiral of toxic shame to step into a gospel-centered living? We identify our shame. Start there. What are the triggers for shame? Is it in parenting? Is it in appearance? Is it in finances? Is it in achievement? Is it in trauma? Identify it. The second thing is acknowledge our limitedness. That is not a bad thing. Being limited is not a bad thing. How do we do this, or what do we do when we acknowledge our limitedness? We reduce secrecy, silence, and judgment. Shame cannot exist in the light. Find a safe person to share your shame with who will not judge you, but who can walk with you into your God-given giftedness. You're about to see a video from one of my best friends, and I can tell you the number of times that her and I have had conversations about shame and about how we work through our insecurities and our inadequacies, and those conversations are horrible. But so freeing and so beneficial for the body of Christ to serve well, because when we acknowledge our shame and acknowledge our limitedness, we can discover our giftedness. Maybe you're sitting here and you know exactly what God has called you on this earth to do. In the church, outside of the church, in your family, you know, and you hate me right now because you have been trying to avoid it for so long. And others of you might be sitting here and be like, I have no idea. Like, uh, hmm. there are so many tools to help you. Read through. Oh my goodness, Paul, in like almost all of his letters, which is a lot of the Bible, talks about the importance of the body and all the different parts and components and giftedness and strengths and weaknesses. Like, you could find a lot out if you just open this book up and read it. But there's personality tests. There's spiritual gifted tests. And you know what else there are? People who know you and can both call you out and encourage you. You want to know where you're gifted? Ask your spouse. You want to know where you're limited? Ask your children. Um, no, but <laughs> find a friend who truly loves you. Ask your therapist. Dude, I love therapy. It's amazing. Your therapist probably knows you better than anyone other than Jesus. Ask your kids, what is mommy really good at? What is daddy really good at? They know. Seek wise counsel, and that might come from the mouth of babes. And the fourth thing is to appropriately connect to the body of Christ. Your body part 
matters for the gospel to spread and to the, for the kingdom to grow. I promise you, you are not an accident. You are not just a product of shame. God knows you intimately. He loves you. He created you. And he's just waiting for you to say, okay. I choose to view myself through the lens of what God says about me instead of what I have told myself or what I have let the world yell at me. I refuse to let what has been said about me in the past stop me from stepping into my God-given potential for the future. I refuse to let my pride get in the way of humbly serving the body of Christ. I refuse to let shame have the last word. Ephesians chapter 4 says he makes the whole body fit together perfectly. As each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. How incredible would it be if this verse could be read, he makes Curtis Lake fit together perfectly because each member does their own special work each member helps the other members grow so that Curtis Lake is healthy and growing and full of love for Sanford and Springvale and York County and Maine and New England and the world. What a legacy that would be. And how incredible that we are invited to step into it. And so I want you guys to get to hear from, like I said, one of my best friends, and I teased her that I almost didn't edit her video and just cut the sermon and let her preach it. But I was selfish and I wanted to. So you get to watch her story for a little bit. But we, we have had these conversations. And like I said, they've been hard, but wow, have we learned so much about each other, about ourselves, about God, and it's about his desire for our church in our world.